Hello. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, this, I'm going to try like a few different things that maybe like transgress Zoom. Um, so first I wanted to, um, I'm going to share my screen and like throughout the uh, workshop, I'm going to offer a couple of prompts. So if you have a pen and a paper, that's great. If you want to use like your computer or your phone, that's also great. Um, and I'm also going to like share a couple of documents with you. So if you can more readily access that, that would be cool too. But the first thing I wanted to do is if you are um, able to right now, if you could turn on, if you could start boiling water um, to make tea. Uh, so I'll explain, uh, or there's like a, give me a second. So I'm gonna be talking about um, eco poetics and liberation and also just like getting more embodied. Uh, but I wanted to offer a recipe for tea. So if you have this in your house um, and if you're, if you're able to, um, if you could grab either bay leaves, rosemary or mint, or if there's a tea that you like that you want to drink, um, drink that. Or if you don't have tea with you, if you could boil hot water or like drink some water. Um, and so just, uh, I'm gonna give people like a minute or so to do something like that. Um, yeah, and if you have questions about that or if you can't, you don't have to do it. So while you're uh, making the tea, I'm assuming you're bringing me with you. Um, and I wanted to talk about an herb that I have recently become kind of obsessed with. It's bay leaf. Um, if you don't know it, that's great. And if you do, you might know it as like a kitchen herb that you kind of always put in soup or maybe in beans. Um, but it has a lot of medicinal properties and health benefits. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about it because it's an, it's an herb that's been used um, in African-American healing traditions and, and black healing traditions. And I sort of wanted to talk about how we have allied with plants in the land um, to heal ourselves and also use herbs to sort of respond to a number of different things that are going on in our bodies. Um, and so to highlight some of that history in like a really tangible way. Um, so bay leaves have a history of uses in treating colds, flu, congestion, bronchitis, um, arthritis, rheumatism, inflammation, and muscle pain. They're also a digestive aid. People also use them if they have headaches. Um, and they're kind of this intellectual herb. So they provide a lot of mental clarity. Um, they can be used, they have a lot of different kinds of uses. So they're used in cooking, they're used as a tea. You can like boil them in a pot of water and it's like aromatherapy. So it'll be kind of like an essential oil. You can use it as a soak for sore muscles and like put it in a bath. And it's also used as a cleansing herb. So you can like hang it over a window or um, a door and cleanse your house and cleanse your space. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted to like highlight the history of the bay leaf. The other herbs I put on here, um, rosemary and mint, they're also good like mental clarity herbs. Um, and they, have a lot, they like support memory um, and sort of promote stress relief. And um, they're also good if you're, if you have a cold or if you have an upset stomach. And then hot water with lemon or just regular hot water is nice because it like gets things circulating in your body. So I just wanted to set this space for movement. Um, yeah, but the, the workshop is going to be about eco-poetics and our relationship to the land. I'm going to talk a little bit about agriculture and food sovereignty. Um, and wanted to start 
after you get your tea ready, um, if you can like put your thumbs up so I can see that you're like ready or in a place to kind of get going. I think you can react on the screen too if, um, and I'll just wait until the majority of folks are ready. Oh, <laughs> someone is drawing. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about, about, I think most people are ready. We're going to talk a little bit about Lucille Clifton, who is like huge dreamboat, love her. Um, she is like an amazing poet and also definitely in what you would call an eco poet. Um, and so I'm, I want to see if this works, uh, but I'm going to put up this screen and I'm also going to send a link in the chat. Um, my computer is very slow today, so. And there's five poems here. And what I want folks to do is pick a poem that they like. Um, yeah, what I want folks to do is pick a poem that they like and read it to themselves. And then um, we're all gonna read our poems, the poems that you chose aloud to each other, like all at once kind of as like an incantation, um, kind of as a way to set the space, but also just like, I'm a, I'm a singer and I love choir. And so like kind of as a choir too. So. Let me know if you can use that. Cool. Cool, looks like it's working. Um, I'll wait for all of your little anonymous animals to pop up. <laughs> and then maybe give a minute or so, or a couple minutes for you to kind of read, um, like read through the poems and then um, we'll sort of give a prompt to, to start. Have you picked your poem? Yeah? All right. We can all start reading in, oh, I need to unmute everyone. Okay, cool. We can all start reading um, in three, two, one. 
Here is where it was dry. I hold their bodies in here. Right the same. Away from my kiss. This is black. The cutting board is black. My feelings. And just for a minute, the greens roll black under the knife. Dark on its side. Kitchen twist dark on its side. And I taste in my natural appetite the bond of living things everywhere. Favorite child of the universe. Feel rolling her hand in its kinky hair. Feels like brushing it clean. Garden's ripest history. Oranges and citron, lime fruit and African apple. Not just the springtime in these wheat fields. White poets call the past. Yay. Oh, we did it. Thank you for joining me in that. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to the slides. Um, yeah, if you haven't read any, and I'm gonna mute you all again, but if you haven't read any Lucille Clifton, um, I totally recommend that you do. I think she's amazing. Um, Um, so I also wanted to offer a prompt, um, like a writing prompt. So if you have your pen and notebook um, or pencil or whatever writing materials you want to use, and you don't have to write, um, you can just kind of respond to this in your own way. But uh, think about something in nature that you feel connected to. So is it the ocean or a patch of woods that you like? Is it something in a park that you visit often? Um, is it a tree that you've spent time with that's like right outside where you live? Is it something growing from the crack in the sidewalk? Is it like a slug that you think is cute? Is it the sound of the wind? Um, like, how did you feel about the storm last night? Um, so any element of like nature that you, that has made you take pause in a little bit, I want you to take like five minutes to write about what kind of connected you to that um, element, what, uh, what was interesting, like what you were curious about, just like take some time to think about it um, and do a little bit of writing around it. I'll set a timer and you can write for as long as you want to, you can draw for as long as you want to, um, but I wanted to start there or it can be as small or as big as you want it to be.
Okay, so you have about a minute left if you want to wrap things up. I'm going to stop there. Cool. Um, so if you can carry that thought with you, there's going to be like two more prompts. So we're going to like build upon some things. Um, but the reason that I asked that question primarily is because um, I, when I was a kid, I, my siblings said, or like my siblings now reflect on me and they're like you were just not an outdoor person like you didn't like being outside you um would stay inside a lot whenever you went outside you like would only really walk around and my siblings like for context played a lot of sports like were excited about like playing in the mud or playing in the snow and I was kind of more hesitant and reticent and I think sometimes with in the environmental movement um there's this like history of like I've always been engaged with nature my parents have a relationship to nature I think there's like a, a tendency to have this like exclusionary um like if you haven't always been connected or haven't always built a relationship or if you feel if you don't feel like fearless in nature um then you can't sort of be a be a part of it or be related to it um and so I had a lot of fear around like nature um and i say like nature and exclamation points because everything is nature and the reason why i have this um painting up by carrie james marshall is that like if you look at the corners of the painting you can see the sidewalk and the grass and so like there's this feeling of like everything everything that our bodies engage with is the environment and everything is nature and so like we are not removed from nature, um, even when we're not in like green spaces or forests or oceans. Um, like the moment you like let the wind in your room, that's like engaging with nature. Um, you're like always in an environment. And so I think it's really important to sort of connect ourselves to nature in like the smallest ways, even if they don't always feel significant or like abundant in the way that like you would see a forest scape. Um, we're just like not removed from those things ever. Um, but I think um, so much of what happens is that uh, people get like removed from natural spaces, like their narrative gets removed. And so um, I want to kind of upend that. Um, and also talk a little bit about black environmental histories, which are like extremely extensive. Um, I think there, I mean, there are a lot of things to talk about here. So I want to like say, first of all, there are things that I chose not to cover. And this is just like a small, um, like a small scope. Um, but one of the biggest things that I wanted to talk about is like our relationship to the environment and being utilized as um, our bodies uh, and spirits being utilized as like tools for colonization and um, the ways that black folks or people of the African diaspora have sort of like upended that narrative and like allied with the land um, as like a protective force and also like allied with indigenous communities um, to resist forms of colonization. And so like talking about environmental histories, not from the place of having um, 
like come from enslaved people, but what are we doing to like actively practice our liberation and what, what has that history looked like? Um, because I think that's really powerful. And I think that's like also healing work. Um, and that's what gets me excited about being outside. That's what get, gets me excited about um, gardening and farming. Um, I didn't really give a ton of context for myself, but I've worked on gardens and farms for a few years. And so this is what I'm like actively interested in and excited about. Um, but I first wanted to talk about quilombos, which um, that's a Portuguese word. Um, and they are, were communities in Brazil, um, kind of 1600s and 1700s, um, but also later there was a, a quilombo in Brazil that lasted for like a hundred plus years, um, but they are maroon communities. And so if you don't know what a maroon community is, it's um, communities of um, enslaved people who escaped and built their own like protective communities. And quilombos in most areas were hard to access. Um, so they were either in mountains or like hidden in forests um, close to like water sources, but really like what what feels important about the way a quilombo is structured or other maroon communities is that it's like hidden in nature. And so there's like this deep allyship with nature and there's this deep um, relationship with the landscape as a tool for like community protection. And so one of the biggest quilombos I wanna talk about is um, the um, Campo Grande, which was in Brazil and existed in like the 1700s. And it was a cluster of quilombos that had like 6,000 people lived in, um, which is kind of amazing to think about like a population of 6,000 people uh, like maintaining their sovereignty. Um, and what they did in quilombos was create like defense structures using natural landscape. So there, it would be like this ring of a tree. And so on the outside would be these like defense mechanisms. And then in the inner core would be like community agriculture. Um, and so I just think that's like a really beautiful way to one, like think about how people have engaged with the land as um, a way to Li liberate themselves, but also to practice self-sufficiency so that the, um, the environment is not something to fear. Um, and I, I, I recommend looking into the history of Quilombos. There's this book called, um, and I have a list of resources that I will send you all, um, but there's this book called um, in the Shadow of Slavery, which is about Africa's botanical legacy, and it talks a lot about um, subsistence plots and subsistence farming and like the migration of um, seeds in the Middle Passage. And so uh, there's this like rich history of um, like crop, cultivati crop cult cultivation and like historical preservation of foods um, that exists today and also like um, in the US and in the Caribbean and in South America. Um, and then I also wanted to talk a little bit about like regenerative agriculture, CSAs and like herbalism, which all, um, all these things are, have come into like um, the, the limelight recently. Um, in terms of like how we can respond to climate change um, or how we can um, practice our own healing. And I think what is um, important to note about specifically regenerative agriculture and CSAs, which are like community supported agriculture, um, CSAs have become like way more prominent, especially um, during COVID. Uh, a lot of people are like subscribing to produce boxes. And the history of that is actually like black history. Um, so regenerative agriculture is something that um, George Washington Carver was really excited about and ad like a huge advocate for. And so he thought a lot about crop rotation, um, thought a lot about soil health 
And so um, understanding that monocropping, things like um, cotton and tobacco have like leached nutrients from the soil. And so he um, was like legumes are nitrogen fixers and like crop rotation is really important. And so that is like a, a tool that's been used and he's not the, he wasn't a person that like invented that, like these things weren't invented, but that regenerative agriculture and like crop rotation are systems that have been in place for a long, long time. Um, and so when people were farming in West Africa um, and ha have been farming in West Africa, they were also using elements of crop rotation um, to access, to like increase soil fertility. And so these systems like have existed for a long time, um, but Carver was one of the people that like widely introduced some of those concepts um, that have then been like appropriated. Um, and so I just wanna like highlight what that looks like. And then um, Booker T. Waitley was working for um, the Tuskegee University, I believe. And he um, was also interested in like food security and better, more widespread food access. And uh, talked a lot about and sort of came up with these, this idea of clientele membership um, organizations or clientele membership clubs which today like translates to community supported agriculture or CSAs, but essentially what a clientele membership was, was that you would pay like the upfront costs um, so that a farmer or like a group of farms could um, grow their crops for the seasons, could maintain their crops. Um, and then as someone who subscribed to the, or as someone who is a member, you would um, go to the farm and pick your own produce. And so it's like this greater connection between you and your food. There's like less of a, there's no grocery store, like supermarket middle person. Um, and it sort of increases that sense of like autonomy around what you're eating and like knowing where it comes from. And the membership was offered at like 40% of the cost of produce at the grocery store. And so like ultimately it was, more affordable, I think still accessible, inac inaccessible for quite a few people um, as CSAs are today. But there have been some like, there's been some really interesting work and like exciting work about CSAs where there's a farm in upstate New York that um, offers CSAs at a sliding scale. Um, and so like, make sure that everyone has access and make sure that the people who are most economically and financially stable are contributing to the like um, food needs of other folks. Um, and then the other thing that I wanna talk about is healing traditions. I think like it's very, very clear currently um, that black folks have been ignored or experimented on by the medical industrial complex. Um, and so, and um, have been for like, years, hundreds of years for, for a lengthy amount of time. And so I think it's also really important to note that like within that disempowering experience or like um, legacy, there's also ways that people have shown up to take care of each other and have allied like in particular with the land, using herbs and plants, using things like weeds that we would like take out of our gardens um, to, to heal themselves and each other, and also to provide support to other community members. Like, um, there's a, a tradition of people using cotton root as um, like an abortive agent. And so I think it's important to like think about um, just the longstanding legacy of healing traditions, and also how things like modern herbal herbalism have also been co-opted by white folks and so just really understanding like what the history is and like who has been kind of doing that labor and like bringing these things to the forefront as like tools that are necessary to our survival and continuing to highlight those histories. Um, there's some really amazing um, herbalists that are prevalent now. Um, the people that I like wanna highlight um, and recognize are Toy Scott 
they actually used to live in Austin um, and don't live here anymore, but they were um, focused on like herbal support for queer trans people of color um, and have like hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents uh, of like herbal resources that I think are like incredible. There's a person, Michelle Ely, who wrote this book called Working the Roots, which um, she like interviews a bunch of um, elders uh, and documents like 400 years of traditional African-American healing and talks about like specific herbs that have been utilized um, again and again and like specific ingredients, things like molasses um, that have been like utilized. And so those are the people, I know less about that, but those are the people to like look toward as sort of amazing, um, amazing people, like doing amazing work. Um, also, I haven't been looking at the chat, so I'm sorry if something's, oh, cool, cool. Um, okay, so the, I wanted to read to you all, um, so if you haven't started drinking your tea yet, now is a good time. Or if you need to get water, now is a good time. I'm gonna read you something that might take a little while, but um, I really like this passage. There's this author, Jamaica Kincaid, who's kind of known for her fiction and nonfiction, um, but she wrote this really cool book called um, My Garden Book, and it has these like, super beautiful pages and um, she is really funny. And this essay in this book is, is amazing. So it's called To Name is to Possess. And it talks about um, binomial nomenclature, which is like the, um, the scientific naming process. Uh, so I'm gonna to read to you and it's gonna take a while so you can sit back and relax. Um, here we go, okay. To name is to possess. The way you think and feel about gardens and the things growing in them, flowers, vegetables, I can see must depend on where you come from. And I don't mean the difference in opinion and feeling between a person from Spain and a person from England, but a difference like this. The implements of the little feast had been disposed upon the lawn of an old English country house and what I should call the perfect middle of a splendid summer afternoon. Part of the afternoon had waned, but much of it was left. And what was left, and what was, left was of the finest and rarest quality. Real dusk would not arrive for many hours, but the flood of summer light had begun to ebb. The air had grown mellow. The shadows were long upon the smooth, dense turf. The great still oaks and beeches flung down a shade as dense as that of velvet curtains. The place was furnished like a room, with cushioned seats, with rich colored rugs, with the books and papers that lay upon the grass. And this, this smooth stoneless drive ran between squat robust conifers on one side and a blaze of canna lilies burning scarlet and amber on the other. Plants like that belong to the cities. They had belonged to the pages of my language reader, to the yards of Ben and Betty's uncle in town. Now, having seen it for myself, because of my Baba, Baba Mukuru's kindness, I too could think of planting things for merrier reasons than the chore of keeping breath in my body. I wrote it down in my head. I would ask my, my guru for, for some bulbs and plant a bed of those gay lilies on the homestead in front of the house. Our home would answer well to being cheered up by such lovely flowers, bright and cheery. They had been planted for joy. What a strange idea that was. It was a liberation, the first of many that followed from my transition to the mission. The first quotation is from Henry Blanche's novel, The Portrait of a Lady, and it can be found isolated in a book called Pleasures of the Garden, Images from the Metropolitan Museum of Art by Matt Griswold, beneath a painting by Pierre Bernard called The Terrace at Vernon. The painting is rich, rich, rich. Rich in color, a profusion of reds, oranges, yellows, blues, greens. Rich in material things, rich in bounty from the land. And the quotation itself, with its little feast, 
its luxurious observations, splendid summer afternoon, and flood of summer light could have been written only by a person who comes from a place where the wealth of the world is like a skin, a natural part of the body, a right assumed, like having two hands and on them five fingers each. It is the second quotation that immediately means something to me, especially this, bright and cheery. They had been planted for joy. What a strange idea that was. These sentences are from a novel called Nervous Conditions by a woman from Zimbabwe named Titi Dengri. Dangaremba. And I suppose it is a coming of age novel and really most people who come from far parts of the world who write books write at some point about their childhood. I believe it is a coincidence. But the book is also a description of brutality, foreign and local. There are the ingredients for a garden, a plot of land, a hoe, some seeds, but they do not lead to little feasts. They lead to nothing or they lead to work and not work is an act and not work is an act of self-definition, self-acclaim, but work as torture, work as hell. And so it is quite appropriate that the young narrator, her name is Tambu, finds in the sight of things growing just for the sheer joy of it, liberation. And what is the relationship between gardening and conquest? Is the conqueror a gardener and the conquered the person who works in the field? The climate of Southern Africa is not one that has only recently become hospitable to flowering herbs. And so it is quite possible, most likely, that the ancestors of this girl Tambu would have noticed them and cultivated them, not only for their medicinal value, but also for the sheer joy of seeing them all by themselves and their loveliness and afternoons that were waning and light that had begun to ebb. At what moment was this idea lost? At what moment does such ordinary everyday beauty become a luxury? When the Spanish marauder Hernando Cortez and his army invaded Mexico, they met floating gardens teeming with flowers and vegetables and moving like rafts over the waters. As they looked down on the Valley of Mexico, seeing it for the first time, a picturesque assemblage of water, woodland, and cultivated plains, its shining cities and shadowy hills, was spread out like some gay and gorgeous panorama before them, and stretching far away at their feet, were seen noble forests of oak, sycamore, and cedar, and beyond, yellow fields of maize, and the towering magi intermingled with or orchards and blooming gardens. There were flowers with their variegated and, and gaudy colors form the greatest attraction of our greenhouses. And again, extensive gardens were spread, filled with fragrant shrubs and flowers, and especially with medicinal plants. No country has afforded more numerous species of these last, and their virtues were perfectly understood by the Aztecs, with whom medical botany may be said to have been studied as a science. All this is from The Conquest of Mexico by William H. Prescott, and is the best history of, the con of conquest I have ever read. Quite likely, within a generation, most of the inhabitants of this place, Mexico, spiritually devastated, would have lost touch with that strange idea, things planted for no other reason than the sheer joy of it. Certainly, if after the conquest, an Aztec had gone into a shop and said, it's my husband's birthday, I would like to give him some flowers. May I have a bunch of Coco Xochitl, please? No one would have been able to help her because Coco Xochitl was no longer the name of that flower. It had become the Dahlia. In its place of origin, Mexico, Central America, the people who lived there had no Dahlia mania no dahlia societies, no dinner plate sized dahlia, no peony, no anemone, no ball shaped, no water lily, no pon pon flower dahlia. The flower seems to have been appreciated and cultivated for its own sake and for its medicinal value. Urinary tract disorders, coco socio means water pipes and as animal fodder. And understandably, beautiful as this flower would have appeared to these people, there were so many other flowers and shrubs and trees and vines, each with some overpowering attribute of shape, height, color of bloom and scent, that it would not be singled out. The sight of this flower would not have inspired in these people a single criminal act. At what moment is the germ of possession lodged in the heart? When another Spanish marauder, Vasco Nunez de, ba de Balboa, was within sight of the Pacific Ocean, he made his army stay behind him so that he could be the first person, like himself, a European person, to see this ocean. It is likely that could this ocean have been taken up and removed to somewhere else, Spain, Portugal, England, 
the people for whom it had become a spiritual fixture would long for it and at the same time not even know what it was they were missing. So the, and so the Dahlia, who first saw it and longed for it so deeply that it was removed from the place where it had always been and transformed, hybridized, and renamed. Fernando Cortez would not have noticed it. To him, the Dahlia would have been one of the details, a small detail of something large and grim, conquest. The Dahlia went to Europe. It was hybridized by the Swedish botanist, Andreas Dahl, for whom it was renamed. I was once in a garden in the mountains way above Kingston, Jamaica, and from a distance I saw a mass of tall stalks of red flames, something in bloom. It looked familiar, but what it resembled, what it reminded me of was a flower I cannot stand. And these flowers I saw before me I immediately loved, and they made me feel glad for the millionth time that I am from the West Indies. This worthless feeling this bestowing special qualities on yourself because of the beauty of the place you are from is hard to resist so hard that people who come from the ugliest place deny that it is ugly at all or simply go out and take someone's beauty, someone else's beauty for themselves. These flowering stalks of red flames turned out to be salvia, but I knew it was salvia only because I had seen it grown, a much shorter variety in North American gardens. And I realized that I cannot stand it when I see it growing in the North because that shade of red can't be borne well by a dwarfish plant. I do not know the names of the plants in the place I am from, Antigua. I can identify the hibiscus, but I don't know the name of a white lily that blooms in July, opening at night, perfuming the air with a sweetness that is almost sickening, and closing up at dawn. There is a bush called whitehead bush. It was an important ingredient in the potions my mother and her friends made for their abortions, but I do not know its proper name. This same bush I often had to go and cut down and tie in bunches to make broom for sweeping our yard. Both the abortions and the sweeping of the yard, actions deep and shallow in a place like that, Antigua, would fall into the category called household management. I had wanted to see the garden in Kingston so I could learn the names of some flowers in the West, in the West Indies, but along with the salvia, the garden had, had in it only roses and a single anemic looking lupine. And this surprised me because lupine is a temperate zone flower and I had very recently seen it in bloom alongside, along the roadside of a town in Finland. This ignorance of the botany of the place I am from and of really only reflects the fact that when I lived there, I was of the conquered class and living in a conquered place. A principle of this condition is that nothing about you is of any interest unless the conqueror dream, deems it so. For instance, there was a botanical garden not far from where I lived, and in it were plants from various parts of the then British Empire places that had had the same climate as my own. But as I remember, none of the plants were native to Antigua. The rubber tree from M Malaysia is memorable because in the year my father and I were, in the year my father and I were sick at the same time, he with heart disease and I, I with hook limbs, we would go and sit under this tree after we ate our lunch. And under this tree, he would tell me about his parents who had abandoned him and gone off to build the Panama Canal. Though of course he disguised the brutality of this. The bamboo grove is memorable because it, is, it was there I used to meet people I was in love with. The botanical garden reinforced for me how powerful were the people who had conquered me. They could bring to me the botany of the world they owned. It wouldn't at all surprise me to learn that in Malaysia or somewhere was a botanical garden with no plants native to that place. There was a day not long ago when I realized with a certain amount of bitterness that I was in my garden, a flower garden, a garden planted only because I wished to have such a thing and that I knew how I wanted it to look and knew the name proper and common of each thing growing in it. In the place that I come from, I would have been, pic I would have been a picture of shame. A woman covered with dirt, smelling of manure, her hair flecked with white dust, powdered lime, her body a cauldron of smells pleasing to her and her back crooked with pain from bending over. In the place I am from, I would have not allowed a man with the same descriptions as such a woman to kiss me. It is understandable that a man like Andreas Dahl would not have demurred at his eponymous honor because this was the 18th century and the honor bestowed upon him by a king, a Charles of Spain, who might, have, who might well have named the flower after himself or a close relative or any one of the many henchmen in his service. Andreas Dahl was very familiar with the habit of naming for he had been a pupil of Carolus Linnaeus. This man, Carolus Linnaeus, had been a botanist and a doctor, and that made sense, botanist and doctor. 
They went together because plants were the main source of medicine in that part of the world then, as was true in the other parts of the world then also. From Sweden, his place of origin, he had gone to the Netherlands for his doctor's degree. And it was there while serving as personal physician to a rich man that he worked out his system, binomial, of naming plants. The rich man, his name was George Clifford, had four greenhouses filled with plants not native to the Netherlands, not native to Europe at all, but native to the places that had been recently conquered. The Oxford Companion to Gardens, a book I often want to hurl across the room, it is so full of prejudice, describes Linnaeus as enraptured with seeing all these plants from far away because his native Sweden did not have anything like them. But most likely what had happened was that he saw an opportunity and it was this. These countries in Europe shared the same botany more or less, but each place called the same thing by a different name. And these people who make up Europe were, are so contentious anyway, they would not have agreed to one system for all the plants they had in common. But these new plants from far away, like the people far away, had no history, no names, and so they could be given names. And who is there to dispute Linnaeus, even if there was someone who would listen? This naming of things is so crucial to possession, a spiritual padlock with the key thrown irretrievably away, that it is a murder and a racing, and it is not surprising that when people have felt themselves prey to it, conquest, among their first acts of liberation is to change their names. Rhodesia to Zimbabwe, Leroy joined Jones to Amiri Baraka. That was the great mystery and much smaller joy of existence, remain unchanged no matter what anything is called, never checks the impulse to reach back and reclaim a loss, to try and make what happened look as if it had, as if it had not happened at all. I think I'll stop there because the rest of it is long. But yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about like naming and possession and also just like recognize, I, I mean, ultimately recognize the fact that um, people have used naming as a tool, naming and claiming as a tool of repression. Um, naming like the land that we're on, um, naming um, like foods as their own or herbs as their own and also just um, like taking people's names away from them. And also talk about like food um, has been, has ultimately like been used as a tool of colonization, both by like taking people's food systems away from them or disrupting them in particular ways. And also, um, and also by like not providing people food. Um, and that, that continues to this day. Um, and I, food is like my passion and I wanted to talk about, offer another prompt of like what foods feel good in your body. Um, so there's like a series of questions here. You can choose to answer one or all of them. Um, you can think about like what I just read to you, but you don't have to. Um, I think like food sovereignty is connected, is like so deeply integrated with the environment. Um, and is deeply integrated with things like housing justice. And um, so yeah, if you wanted to answer any of these prompts, I can read them to you. What foods feel good in your body? Is food a connection to your culture or lineage or heritage? Um, in what ways? What does it feel like? What are your food dreams? Um, like what, what food do you dream of? Um, what do you want your relationship to food to feel like? What do you think food and food systems could look like after capitalism? Um, and then when are you most connected to yourself? And also these don't have to like emit good feelings either. Um, not all of this is like brings up good things. So I think I'm gonna give like 10 minutes for people to respond um, and time you and remember to like drink your water or your tea or whatever. Um,
Okay, so we have about three minutes left. Um, as you're like wrapping up, I'd love for folks to send me like a word or a phrase that's coming from um, like writing or responding to this. I'm going to collect them in like a, a document and share them toward the end um, along with like responses to another prompt. So if there's something that you're like excited about sharing, it doesn't have to be big, but just something that you're thinking about, you can send it to me in the chat. And if you don't want to share, you don't have to. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can collect some of these. Um, but yeah, you have about a minute left. Okay, um, cool, we can, I'm gonna share my screen again. Uh, you can definitely keep sending me stuff and I'll just put it on this document that I'm creating um, and we'll have time to share it together. But give me a second. Cool. Um, I want us to talk a little bit about practices of food sovereignty, um, particularly um, from like an African diaspora perspective um, and some organizations that I'm really excited about, but also some like thinkers that I'm really excited about. And also um, I recently um, was working in a, a nonprofit, like on a nonprofit farm and I think there are term, like specific terms that nonprofits use that I think get like misinterpreted or misused. Um, I think many of us maybe understand how that happens or why that happens. Um, but 
Karen Washington, who founded this uh, organization called Black Urban Growers as a way to like connect um, Black folks who are, who are growing food in cities, um, has this like really great article on food sovereignty. Um, and food sovereignty come, is a term that comes from La Via Campesina, um, which is an international um, peasant farm workers movement. Uh, they have like a, a newsletter that comes out all the time um, and they are like really focused on food sovereignty. And so food sovereignty is not just, it's different from food justice and it's not just focused on food access, but is like primarily focused on like really concrete self-determination um, through the food system. And so like people having their own grocery stores, determining what is healthy for them selves, like determining for themselves what is healthy for themselves. Um, and so not focused on like, we have to educate certain people about what health looks like, um, but really like people know what health needs that they have and know what health looks like. And so respecting and like honoring that and utilizing it as a way to like create and determine food systems, like communities around food um, and like ultimately food security. Um, and also like, I, in my belief, food sovereignty decreases dependence on like governmental structures. Um, and so that's why there's like a fear and repression around food sovereignty efforts. Um, and I just wanna note that too, because nonprofits have used like the language of food sovereignty, but they're still invested in, a lot of them aren't invested in like dismantling um, like oppressive structures because uh, they still benefit from it. Um, and so that's how like La Via Campesina and Karen Washington are interconnected. And then I wanted to talk about like two kind of food security and like food sovereignty efforts um, that are ongoing that sort of like reflect uh, what a transition um, like outside of our current economic system could look like. Uh, so there's the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network and the Cherry Hill Food Co-op, um, which is connected to this larger institute called the Black Yield Institute. The Cherry Hill Food Co-op is um, in Baltimore. And both of these um, like networks and organizations are focused on like building grocery stores in their community that are community owned um, and run. And so that the members like have control over what's happening within the co-op but also both of these um, organizations have explicitly tied the work that they do to food sovereignty. And so it goes beyond like, oh, we're creating a different system or oh, we're responding to a need, but oh, there's like this actual, a larger um, political uh, force in, in, in play. Um, and so food is like a touch point into a broader liberation. Um, and I think that's, really important. And then I wanted to offer one more prompt. Uh, we can have about 10 minutes for this one. I know I didn't talk about those last, this last bit a ton. Um, I guess what I can say about like why I moved from like eco poetics into something like food sovereignty is mostly because of like my own um, sort of inclinations. Um, my relationship to nature is like deeply tied to my relationship to like cooking and being in the kitchen. Um, and that's how I like got reconnected to the land um, or like got connected to it in the first place. And I think it's also important for us to think about um, or remember that like nature, land, the wild is not only a productive force for our own like use and ends, um, but has its own like inclinations and there's so many like relationships that are ongoing. And so it's complicated to like tie it to food production, I'm, I'm sure. Um, and so I wanna like recognize that and say that like, there are so many things happening in nature that are unknowable um, and that's, those relationships are important too. And I think that's, why like Lucille Clifton's work is kind of amazing because um, she talks about the earth being a living thing. And 
so yeah wanting to resist like the thingification of nature like that it's only like production oriented or that it's only serving us um but that we have like a responsibility and like reciprocity to it um and then it's not just like a singular thing also <laughs> uh but yeah i wanted to offer one last prompt which is maybe bigger um and so the questions are when do you feel most free what kind of world do you want or do you want to build what does liberation look like what does it feel like what does it sound like who's there and also what does it feel like to hear and i think this is especially for like people of color on this call um what does it feel like to hear the land wants us back um like what do you think of when you hear that um and same thing as the last prompt if there's like a phrase or a thought that you want to send me that you're willing to share have shared with the group um i would love to receive that and collect it in this document so about like 10 ish minutes And you can also like draw or record yourself saying something.
Okay, so we have a couple more minutes left. Um, so if you're wanting to share a phrase or a thought, um, you can definitely send that my way. Again, no pressure to And there's about a minute left. So if you want to find a place to pause, um, you're welcome to. Um, I see people's last comments, so I'm going to, I think I'm going to continue to stop sharing <laughs> so I can add them. Um, but yeah, I have like a couple more thoughts. Um, I think the first being that like, uh, it is actually, give me a moment to collect myself. Um, can't think and do at the same time. So I'm actually going to share your thoughts so you can see each other and like witness each other. Um, and they all fit on this little page. Uh, ooh, there might be one more. Okay, there's one more. It's not gonna fit. But. Beautiful. Okay. Um, usually when I do something like this, I like to have people read these phrases out loud. 
uh, is that something that people would be interested in so that they can hear each other? Like, so you can hear each other and your thoughts? Or do you just want to read it, like, in your space? Okay, ambivalent response. So I'm gonna go with, we can just read it together, <laughs> like in our own zones. <laughs> um, and I'll give you some time to read these. There's a little bit more. I'm going to move down. And then you can sit with that for a second. I feel like, is everyone done? Has everyone read what they needed to read? Yes, yes, cool. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to this screen. And present. Um, your thoughts are beautiful. Um, I hope these prompts were nice for you. Uh, they're, yeah, they're all like really, really great to hear. Um, and I am interested in like people thinking more about them. So if you're interested in writing more, or, like talking more with me about some of those things, that's always a conversation I'm wanting to have. Uh, but um, I wanted to offer this like quote that I've been holding with me from Alexis Pauling Gums. Um, and I think it's like, it's not like everything, but I, I, I think it's just beautiful. And I think it's something for us to sit with. And um, I love to hear people thinking about abolition as something that is very, very possible for us and very um, present and very close. Um, and so I love what's here. Um, what if abolition isn't a shattering thing, not a crashing thing, not a wrecking ball event? What if abolition is something that sprouts out of the wet places in our eyes, the waiting places in our palms, the tremble holding in my mouth when I turn to you? What if abolition is something that grows? What if abolishing the prison industrial complex is a fruit of diligent gardening, building, and deepening of a moment to respond to the violence of this state and the violence in our communities with sustainable, transformative love. Um, and I just love and think the insight is important to be like building trust and building community. And I think food and like reconnecting with nature and like getting into our bodies are some of the ways to offer that to each other and like truly hold space for each other. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. And so I don't think that's like an end point. Um, but I also love this image. It's by the same uh, painter that I was talking about, Carrie James Marshall. Uh, and this is 
called Untitled, um, Wishing Well. He has a series of these like amazing, beautiful vignettes of like people in cityscapes surrounded by flowers. And um, I, yeah, I'm just like obsessed with his paintings. Uh, I think they're reverent. <laughs> and also wanted to offer some resources and some space for questions um, or thoughts. I don't, I'm definitely not like an expert on anything um, and just shared with you like a collage of things that I've been thinking about. Um, and so the, like the most important thoughts for me are like, liberation on the land is like uh is essential and um black and indigenous liberation is interconnected and so like we always have to be thinking about that as we're thinking about like reconnecting to the land and um this is a list of resources and readings that i've been moving through for like years now and would love to share with you there's also some people that are really good resources on here um, if you're interested in any more of that. And I can put my email on this list as well. But yeah, if anyone has any thoughts or questions uh, or wants, if anyone wants to talk to each other, I'm gonna unmute you all. I would love you to talk to each other. Oh, this is great. Thank you all very much. This was really wonderful. Thank you so much for this. This was really wonderful. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions or anything? Um, can we, um, are y'all going to send the book recommendations out? after or do I need to grab them now? I, I can send them after or I can send them to you, KB, and you can disperse them if you want to. But I can also give you my email in the chat and you can, and I can send it to you through email. That's yeah. awesome, thank you. I was gonna say, um, afterwards I usually like post the recording and then post whatever resources were shared during the presentation in the Facebook event. So um, I could definitely do that um, as well here. I'm actually gonna like put a fuck ton of links in the chat in just a second. So um, have a good story. Thank you so much. Um, all the applause, all the flowers, all of the amazing feelings and sentiments to you. I want to just share my screen for a second to talk a little bit about um, where we could go from here. So happy to see all of y'all. Um, if you'd like to leave an eval, uh, like I said, close to the beginning, that's like how we get better. That's how we make this series better. Um, so please, if you have just like a couple minutes to be like, hey, this was awesome. This is what I liked about it. So we can continue to do that. Or this is something that I would change. Um, please like let us know. We have a couple of artists on series, um, other events coming up. Um, our next one is with soups. Um, they're going to talk about natural solutions to climate change, food supply chains, the politics behind farming, common buzzwords around food and accessibility to food specific to Austin. Um, and that's going to be literally next week. Um, and right after that, we're going to have uh, how sexuality, incarceration, and artistry are all impacted by the climate crisis. That's going to be a really like generative workshop. Um, so I would definitely suggest if you're um, coming to that one, like being ready to write. Um, so yeah, really exciting stuff. And then we're going to end it all with a panel. 
um, also on the 30th, where we're all going to come together, um, all the workshop folks, and talk about how climate change and sustainability informs our artistic practice. Um, so I'd love to see y'all at any of those events. I'm happy to share these resources that Ona has shared in the Facebook event later today. Um, if you'd like to like sign up for our newsletter that just has all of the events that I literally just told you about, as well as similar events happening in Austin around social justice, around art, and things like that. Um, and then we also have an Artist of the Month feature that we do every month. Please uh, consider signing up. Follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook if you want to keep up with the things that we are doing. If you have any rich aunts um, or uncles or anything <laughs> in your family, please tell them to donate to our cause. Uh, we are a completely volunteer run um, and we want to continue putting on cool programs such as this one. Um, and we also have a separate program called our Artist Showcase and Open Mic, where we showcase two different artists um, with historically marginalized backgrounds from the Austin community every month. This upcoming month in June, we're featuring uh, SC Says and Njira Keith, who are both really amazing um, local artists, social justice activists here in Austin. Um, and if you, you know, want to share all of the probably amazing things, because those prompts were really great, um, all of the really cool things that we had today um, at our next open mic, like, um, but that's pretty much all I have for y'all. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop record, stop sharing. <laughs>